we've obviously had two panels this morning that set the stage, I think, for this third panel, vis-a-vis -vis sort of outlining the context of the challenge in the first panel and then some industry-specific discussion that we um, just heard from. We are going to hopefully try to come up with some creative approaches to solve our 21st century skills challenges. I'm going to be brief, and I would ask my panelists to try to be brief so that we can um, foster some additional discussion um, this afternoon. And I'm also respectful of the fact that we are the only thing largely keeping you from lunch. <laughs> um, a couple of things as I listen to the discussion, then I will, I will turn to Daphne to, to move us forward. One of the challenges we're looking at at Microsoft is, is dealing with digital exclusion issues. And we haven't talked too much about that, at least I didn't hear it, and I missed part of the first panel, so I apologize for that if, if it was discussed. Um, we firmly believe, and I know others in this room um, are, are looking at these issues, that if, if we really want to integrate more kids of color, more women, other folks into the STEM pipelines, then we've got to bring um, more broadband capacity to, to many more communities around the country who have been digitally excluded for far too long. Um, we firmly believe that that digital exclusion has cost people jobs and opportunity. Um, we are working with the Clinton Global Initiative, with our friends at the FCC, with our friends at the Department of Education, develop tools that will actually measure, if you've got access to broadband, what it costs you in terms of unemployment, tax bases, et cetera. Um, and then working with um, our friends at Comcast, NBC, and hopefully lots of partners, some of which may well be in this room, to figure out how we get uh, a million kids access this year and then over the course of the next three to four years nine million kids so we go to we go at the fifth you know the top two thousand schools here in the united states that produce fifty percent of our dropouts and if we really are i believe going to increase our stem pipeline we can't just talk to the kids in the science club we've got to branch way way beyond that as we become much more a minority majority country mm -hmm. and that i think is is truly one of our greatest challenges is how we do all of those integrations at once and I guess lastly, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Daphne, couldn't agree more about as we enter a period of, of fiscal retrenchment, we've got to be more creative. We clearly need to figure out how the private sector works more closely with government, with academia, with NGOs, et cetera. I've been to, I think, too many meetings where we have 40 or 50 like-minded companies or other like-minded individuals in the room where all, they all talk about their wonderful efforts, and they are wonderful efforts. Um, unfortunately, too often, in my personal opinion, they're one-offs. They're not brought together. We don't have synergy. We don't have leverage. We don't bring all of our assets to the table. And I think, and my boss made a speech on this at the chamber last week to talk about larger corporate responsibility. And I think given this retrenchment, it is an issue that we have to look at much more broadly and what are the pieces of glue that can come together um, that actually can bring all these like-minded companies, individuals, NGOs, government entities together to collectively look from stem to stern, um, as someone said earlier, at the challenges we've got not only in our STEM pipeline but in our broader educational um, 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 challenges that we've got through K-12 through, K through or K-20, through if you will. So with that, um, I will um, be really thrilled and interested to hear from our panel, and with that, we start with Daphne. I must say that, of course, all of our bios are in your packets uh, for the sake of time. These are all wonderful people. Lucy <laughs> wouldn't bring them together if they weren't wonderful people. So, Daphne, at, with that. Thank you. Um, so your comments are a great segue in terms of, of NAF, the National Academy Foundation. People know what NAF is? Anybody in the room know about NAF? Very. <laughs> I'm on a personal mission to make sure that everybody, everybody knows, knows about, about NAF. NAF. <laughs> great. Good. Another so, personal mission. As am I. So, um, <laughs> so NAF is a, a national, stands for National Academy Foundation represents made up of 500 academies, over 500 academies in 40 states, whose goal it is to help high school students find their passions and help them on career paths by uh, helping supporting them with skill acquisitions, with career path development, and giving them access to business and professionals through internships. Uh, they, the organization focuses on several specific sectors in the economy, from hospitality and financial services to IT and engineering, and now health sciences has been piloted this year with uh, over 17 academies in a pilot phase. And uh, everything we've talked about this morning ultimately speaks to how do we sort of work it backwards. We can all complain about the absence of talent and the absence of skills, but how do we serve, as you said, underserved communities that are not part of the science club? And 
uh, engender a passion and an interest in uh, particular areas to, of study that are both vocational and then range from the vocational to the highly professional in underserved communities. And that's is NAF's mission and is one uh, that is a, a great um, collaboration and aggregation of some of the issues that we've talked about. So that is uh, developing curriculum that will give uh, young kids a skill set that they need to take into the marketplace, to introduce them to professions that might be of interest, and then to par partner with the private sector through these internships where they are exposed to professionals and advi regional advisory boards that help them to really see what it means to be in the workplace, uh, get job exposure and skill exposure in terms of their futures. So uh, that's that's what NAF does. Um, I just have another hat that I wear that I also kind of want to introduce into the conversation because I think it's really important, which is I sit on the board of an organization called Young Audiences, Arts for Learning, and uh, which serves over 5 million kids in 7,000 schools around the country. And uh, we've been talking about STEM all morning, but I'd also just like to introduce the idea that we also need STEAM, which is the introduction of arts in the <laughs> conversation. And while certainly in this fiscal environment that's hard to talk about, it is really a critical aspect of the conversation when we talk about what will uh, give us the competitive edge that the United States needs to to sustain into the future and that will allow us to creatively see some of these skills that we're talking about in a way that is imaginative and doesn't look in terms of just fulfilling our employment needs in the next five years, but what the world's going to look like in 20, 25 years from now. So, that was fast enough? That was excellent. Thank you, Daphne. I, I, and I would say, you know, from our perspective, when we talk more broadly, this isn't about sort of Microsoft per se, but we've got 150,000 partners out there. I know Sarah at Oracle's got partners. Those 150,000 partners, almost all of them have 50 employees or less. Mm -hmm. And they need an entire range of skilled workers, not just your IT pros. And so that's why we strongly believe that unless you have that base of digital skills, mm -hmm. you're not going to be an auto mechanic, you're not going to work in, in green jobs, you're not going to work in financial, you're not going to work in IT, you're probably not going to work in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the growing fields, <laughs> that tends to be most of them. Um, and, and so we would prefer that people not relegate themselves to 8 or $10 an hour, but really have a career that allows them to have family wages and allows them to have a ladder forward. That's why we're in it, and I know that's why my good friend Sarah's in it, so I look forward to her comments as well. Thank you. Um, I'm with that tiny, other tiny little software company called Oracle. We make a little bit of hardware now. Um, we're growing. We actually grew by 44% last year in headcount in the United States. Um, in the last 90 days, we had 2,700 new jobs globally. So we have good kind of problems, I think, in our field. The unemployment rate in my industry is 3.4%. So if you're unemployed in tech, it's, it's, we're finding it's by choice, not by circumstance for the most part. 90% of the people we hire are straight out of industry or universities. Um, in California alone, we had 250 jobs just from September 1st through to September 30th. I just happen to know that number off the top of my head. Um, in terms of creating that qualified workforce and <coughs> using voc ed and using that entire pipeline from pre-K through workforce development, there are no secrets. We know how to do this. Um, we've been doing it at Oracle, but the, I, I see program after program that's successful. And there's just a problem in terms of understanding how this change moves forward. It's not the 1958 school model anymore. But when you have parents who were raised in the 1970s or 1980s, and the, easy it's, now, easy, hey, or 1950s, and say, if it's not the same school system that you went through, sometimes it's foreign, it's strange, you know, change is strange, and you get a little, well, why is my kid doing new math, or why is my, computer science is for college? Well, computer science is for middle school. Um, it's not for co just for college anymore. Engineering is not just for a master's program; it's for pre-kindergarten too everything, you know, at its own level. And so that part, I think, is one of the big stop gaps we have. Now, at Oracle, you know, qualified workforce is our number one asset. Um, a qualified workforce is what makes us run. It's our steel. Um, you know, if you have to compare it to the old, older industries, it's our steel. Our people are our steel. Um, the smarter they are, the better products we make, the better problems we solve. Um, and we do about $2 billion in educational philanthropy around the country, and one of those programs is the Oracle Academy. And it's, it's weird, you know, people hear us, I'll talk about the Cisco Academy, I'll talk about Microsoft's philanthropy, because we all do something, and we all do something really, really great, and most of the time it's free. 
Um, and we do this to high schools, and we, we give this to high schools and community colleges. Our program, it's a goal. It's a long-term investment. We're trying to encourage kids to go into technology, to engineering, math, physics programs to get that four-year degree. But we also have seen successes with kids right out of high school getting jobs because they have an Oracle certification that they got in the 12th grade. And when they go to these small, medium-sized businesses to show off their skills, they're not said, oh, well, we'll pay you this. They're asked how much. How much do you want to do this one project for me for three months? That's, those are good problems to have when you're a 20-year-old kid and you get to sit in your dorm room in flip-flops and design a, a database for a small company, and they're, they're telling you to name your price. Um, what we do with the Oracle Academy, it has four steps. We provide free teacher training, um, train the teacher model. We train them in SQL or PL SQL. Um, it's a two-year program. We do free, it's 10 weeks online, five days face-to-face, -face, and at the end of that, they can go directly into the classroom and teach SQL, which is the foundation of my company it's eight, 30 years ago. And then their students can get a certification after two years and go into the workforce. We prefer them to go to four-year college, but people have to get jobs. People can get part-time jobs while they're in a school program. And I've erroneously been saying, oh, well, you know, if you're in the community college program, you have to finish that associates and get into the workforce. 30 community college teachers told me this summer, no, no, we're seeing our kids graduate and they're going straight into the workforce and they're getting entry-level tech jobs because the demand is high. And yesterday, I actually had a friend who said, hey, you work for Oracle. Do you have an Oracle DBA's resume I could have? Because I need to hire somebody over at the FAA. The demand is there. So if anybody knows somebody, by the way, I'd love to pass on a resume. Um, it's a long-term investment. Now, we have a four-step to our program. We do the model I just gave you. We train the teacher, et cetera. Well, by the fourth step, we want the school district or the state to basically take over that process. And all we're doing is giving you free curriculum. You're training your own teachers. You're hiring the teacher instructor. There's one country in the world right now that does this. It's Romania. <laughs> in five years, it only took them five years, all we do is make one phone call. And their only request to Oracle right now is, can you make the classes harder? Mm. And they have to take this in order to graduate. These are their high school students. The biggest growth we've had in the last year was Egypt. Egypt, during their revolution, which I won't talk too much about in this building because I don't know enough about it, um, we had 900 teachers sign up to do our summer training. In the United States, we had less than 200. So and when, when, when it actually came time to do the training, we had about 150 in the U.S., 720 in Egypt. Tra teachers were trained on how to teach SQL to their kids. They're hungry for it. They're ready to go for it. Now, we have a very successful model. It works in the U.S. It's just small. We want to grow it. I personally met with every single legislator in the state of California this year, last year. I didn't get one phone call back. We invented this in California. Um, and we would like to deliver it more in California and throughout the country. Um, the one example I'll give you of a successful model um, before I turn it over, in Chicago Public Schools, um, we had a call January 10th last year from a woman named Brenda Wilkerson. And she is a public school administrator and said, hey, I have four teachers signed up for your Oracle Academy. I'm ready to go. And, and we said, great. That was the most we ever had seen from one school district in 10 years, four teachers. We were thrilled. And she called back, and she said, I can't afford to send them to, to Maryland to do the training. Can, can you send me an instructor? And we said, no, because we know one of your teachers is going to drop out, and it's just not cost effective for us to send an instructor for four teachers. And she said, well, give me, give me a number. I'll get you that many teachers. And we said, you'll never get it. We, we put this challenge out to every state in the union. Nobody's ever gotten us this magic number. It's very, very difficult to do. We need 30 teachers. She called us back seven days later with 37 teachers enrolled, ready to go. And that was in one summer. That was in one week. She went school to school and explained to each teacher what the value was to their student and how they could do the training. It wasn't something scary and foreign that they actually could be very successful at it. Um, this year we trained 72 teachers in Chicago public schools, as did Cisco, by the way. Every kid in Chicago public schools has access to a computer science class right now. That, you can't say that for anywhere else. In Fairfax County, one of the wealthiest districts in the country, you can't say that anywhere else. But you do have that in Chicago, a Title I school district, because of one person. Um, we go wherever we get a phone call back. Um, and I think that's true for, for my, my colleagues, too. We want to do this. We want to see computer science in every high school. Because we, even if you're not going to become the tech worker of the future, at least you'll be a better consumer of the technology because you understand it from the other side. Um, 
my suggestions to moving forward are computer science in every high school as a requirement, not an elective, not for the geekiest kid in the school, for everybody. And we've seen 13-year-olds learn SQL in Egypt, so we can do this in this country. Um, encourage distance learning as a method to learning, not as a sole requirement, not to remove teachers, but just to enhance classroom learning and to invest in public schools. And I always remind everybody lately in the last few weeks, um, this was invented from California public schools when they were the best in the country. Steve Jobs' highest level of certification was a California high school diploma. That's what he earned, okay? That's, what, that's how we changed our lives. So public schools can be the key to our future again. Thank you, Sarah. Just <laughs> and picking up on that, we do all do teacher training. Um, when we do it, the first two days, we don't use the word technology because it gets back to what Sarah's point was. This is about human capital. Mm -hmm. This is about leadership. And if you think that a piece of technology is going to suddenly transform you from A to B without you knowing how to appropriately um, um, use it in the classroom, how to integrate it with your ch children, et cetera, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. Um, Sarah also mentioned certifications, but that's why we're lucky to have Tony on our panel. Um, last year, if I, my numbers are correct, cert community colleges did 650,000 certifications in this country and only did about 400,000 AS degrees. So certifications are becoming the trend line. Those six and eighth month portable job credentials, as we like to call them, that allows a worker, whether they're in Seattle, Washington, or Savannah, Georgia, to work because the employer knows they meet certain criteria that all employers recognize around the board. So Tony, with that, I turn it over to you. I'm Tony Fowler. Um, I think I'm gonna go from the specific to the general here. But I, wanted, I wish Kent were in here because I, I didn't realize it was running a barber shop, you know, because uh, you hang around the barber shop, you get a haircut. If you hang around here too long, they're going to ask you to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that I was going to be speaking yesterday, um, but I'm grateful to be here. And, um, you know, I just want to start off generally is that, you know, education is failing in the United States. And if it were a business, we'd have, we'd have boarded up the buildings uh, generation, literally generations ago. We have... Uh, we have a customer base of students, 25% uh, to 60% that don't show up um, every day. The Secretary of Education was in Detroit on the first day of school. 45% of the students in the system were not in school on the first day of school. That's a big problem. And if I could give you one takeaway today, they do surveys of kids who drop out of school. And the number one answer that kids give I, they say, I would not have dropped out of school if someone had just talked to me. Just think about that for a minute. Um, I really am uh, excited about uh, what I'm doing now outside of the context of working in the Department of Education because I'm working with uh, Bill Simons, who was the author of the Pathways to Prosperity Report, which came out of Harvard in February. If you haven't seen it or read it, I highly suggest that you download it off of the Harvard uh, Education website. It basically, per, I, I could have written this report because it basically is my orientation. And it basically says, who needs a four-year degree? You don't necessarily need a four-year degree to get a lot of jobs in the U.S. economy. And it's really important that business step up and let people know what is, what's required for jobs of today. Because if there are certifications that students can work towards, let's give them that information. Because what we know about public schooling, not to say anything, you know, but <laughs> you can go to 12 years of public school in the United States and never have a conversation with anybody about getting a career. Education is treated as an end in itself. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about community colleges is that I would guess, I haven't seen the data, but I would guess that that it's one of the only places where people really have an end in mind when they enter a, a community college because community colleges are oriented towards that it's like you're you're going in there to get a certification you're going in there to, there to get specific training that you can use sometimes after you you completed the the program sometimes you get the job then you go to the community college and you get your certification and then you get paid more uh, community colleges are, are um, really a big answer to what's going on in, in the United States. 
Uh, I wanted to also just say it was fortunate that I was in a, when I go out and speak around the country, what I tell business people, and I, I talk to a lot of, I'm on Susan's committee, and you know, what I tell people is, if you want to have workforce, grow your own. Literally grow your own. And I'm, it's fortunate that we had the congressman for, from Wisconsin today because I had an interaction with Mercury Marine uh, just because I found out about something in this room, actually, uh, several, a couple of months ago. Mercury Marine moved into Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and built their headquarters there because they loved the place. And then they looked around and they, they took a look at what's happening in the school system, and they realized that this school system is not going to produce the kind of workers that we're going to need. And so this year, Mercury Marine is opening up a grade three to five STEM school in the Fond du Lac School District with plans to go from seven to eight and then into high school. So there's gonna, they are building their own pathway for their future workforce. And that's what I say to everybody in industry today. You've gotta, you gotta you know, roll up your sleeves, get engaged with students, and, you, and use what you know and import that information into the brains of little kids. You know, because I've been here in Washington for 25 years, and one of the things that we love to do, we celebrate the fact that we've identified a problem, <laughs> okay? And we talk about the problem, and we talk, and I got so frustrated, I really got so frustrated because I was involved in the Gathering Storm report, and I was in a lot of those meetings, and I'm sitting around, and everybody's talking about the problem. I'm not interested in the problem. When they released the report, and we were over there at the Academy of Sciences, and they had all these speakers, and every, from industry, from government, you name it, everybody was talking about the problem. There was only one person, one person who came up and provided an answer, and it was Dean Kamen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been worth it if I had not heard Dean make his presentation about FIRST Robotics, because he talked about taking over the world with FIRST Robotics. And I have since become involved, and I'm a, I'm a judge, and I'm an ambassador, and everywhere I go, I talk about FIRST Robotics. And the only reason I talk about FIRST Robotics is because I've gone and spoken to the kids who are engaged in FIRST Robotics. And over and over and over again, what I hear is, I never thought I'd be interested in math and science. I am boys and girls, I mean, they had a girls team from Pittsburgh last year that, um, you know, it's just amazing the transformation that occurs in these kids' lives. Because they never wanted to be involved in math and science, now they want to be engineers, okay? And um, it's just an incredible transformation. The other thing that hasn't been mentioned is Project Lead the Way. Dick Blaze, a friend of mine who got frustrated and retired, but, you know, it's beside the point said, you know, I can do this better. Basically what he said is that I, he was an administrator in a school district. He said, I can do this better. And he invented a new way to do math and science education, engineering education, and created, and it, it has to combine teacher training and, and uh, up-to-date curriculum with up-to-date equipment that kids can use. And that's what they've produced. And they're all over the country now. And I was, I was with Google earlier this year. They made a presentation, with, and they said exactly what you said. They said, we need more computer science in the classrooms. And I went up to them. It was, you know, in one of the Senate buildings. And I went up to them at the end of the meeting, and I said, listen, if you want to have computer science in every school, start your own school. That's the only way to do it. And they invited me out to Mountain View, and I spent the day with them at the campus to talk about how there's already a template. It's called Project Lead the Way. All they have to do is plug their curriculum into Project Lead the Way, and you've got a completely different subject area that's covered using that me methodology. I am convinced that it would work. And I don't, I really haven't heard back from them, but you know, any of you can pick it up and, and run with it, really, frankly. Um, I d let me just, because we're talking about uh, females in education, I just, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, in Pathways to Prosperity, on page, I don't have my glasses on, 32, I think, um, there's a little graph here, and it's about females in post-secondary education. 57% uh, of women 
are, are make up the, the college student body. I worked with an Einstein fellow several years ago, and he did the, he did, he ran the numbers. And he basically said that before 2050, the last American male will graduate from college. <laughs> that's, that's a serious problem. And it's a problem that begins in K-12. It begins when that kid is acting like a boy and they're giving him medication so that he will stop acting like a boy. And they get beaten down and they stop coming to school because there's nothing in the school for that kid. And it's not just boys, it's boys and girls. That's why we have a dropout problem. So what industry can do is that they can step up and make education and schools a worthwhile place for kids to go to. And, and the, the first thing you need to do is to impress upon them that there is a future, and the future includes getting a good job and doing something worthwhile with your life. I've got five kids. None of them really knows what they want to do. You know, I want them to move out. But I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. And, and I really believe that it is the fault of the system because kids aren't given choices. And when we, when we see and get ourselves in environments where kids have been given a choice, and it's not just first robotics, it's a, a real-world design challenge. I was at a program earlier this week, and the real-world design challenge last year, these kids invented a new wing for the 747 using, uh, invented a cover for the wing so that it would be more aerodynamic and would save on fuel. They, in the process of developing that wing, they developed a software program because they kept on doing their, their calculations over and over again, and they decided that they'd just create a software program to do the calculations for them. And, uh, and Cessna bought the software from them. I mean, this is amazing. Kids can do amazing things. But we have to remember, they're kids, and that kids are excited about things. Kids love to compete, which they don't do in public schools. There's no competition in public schools except for on the football field. But, you know, kids really respond to, to competition when they're given the opportunity. And it's up to us. It's really up to us to make those opportunities available to them. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate the passion for sure. Um, Bob, tell us about where the AFL is. I know that I've seen lots more apprenticeships spark, um, um, being established in the IT industry. I see through our friends at CWA, et cetera. But talk about it from your perspective in the industrial side, the manufacturing side, and, and, and where, where can we help workers get the skills they need to be successful moving forward? Well, let me start from the uh – I'll do just the opposite of you, Tony. I'll start from the general and move to the specific on, on these things. But I, I think there's something I've heard through all three panels this morning that, I mean, it strikes a chord here. There's, there's a little message here that I think we gotta, we got to deal with. One is a lack of strategy. A, you want to talk about education training strategy in the nation? <laughs> Don't have it. Um, talk about a manufacturing strategy for the nation? Don't have it. And these feed each other, and they're a problem for each other in all of this. Um, the issue of, man by the way, let me give you a website, uh, www.aflcio.org backslash manufacturing, because we have a new paper on manufacturing and security that speaks to everything. I could have been on the last panel um, <laughs> in terms of thinking about this and thinking about ourselves as a country. Uh, and I've given this speech a dozen times in the last three weeks, or pieces of it, about what's our strategy as a country around manufacturing, around a, t a clean technology, clean energy industry society, and how do we create those jobs? How do we generate these things? Think of it this way. You wonder why kids don't get opportunities. They're also not stupid. I agree with much what Tony said about the role of community colleges, and not everybody needs a four-year degree. And there's a different way to do these things. But the idea that this country doesn't have a strategy on these things has resulted in something like this. In the last decade, we lost six million manufacturing jobs in the country, all right? One-third of the entire workforce. Now, people think I'm talking about just the frontline workers and the skills they need in, in that world. I'm not. Think about the 500,000 to 1 million of those workers who are actually the scientists, the engineers, the software people, the IT people, and on down the line that are part of that whole professional technical world 
combined with the skills of the front lines worker that are supposed to provide the innovation and the creativity and that process improvement and the next next idea that should be the next investment that will be made in this economy and in fact is being made in someone else's. We have pulled the plug on the stream of those jobs and you wonder why our young people aren't in engineering and why the rest of the world comes here to get the best education in the world. I mean this is all part of this puzzle and all part of this problem of a society which in fact lives under philosophy that says free markets decide everything for us and government has absolutely no role. We shouldn't be in here because government should never rule in this today. I mean, that's part of the problem. That's not the way the rest of the world operates. And that's not why we are seeing successes in other economies, whether you want to talk about developing world economies or you want to talk about Germany, with a high-wage, high-skill economy that has come out of this collapse very differently, but not just this collapse, because what's happened in manufacturing and these critical sectors that provided good middle-class jobs for working people in this country, they don't do it that way in those countries. I'm going to use that partially as an example. So that's part of what I would say is a big overarching concern about our country and our inability to have a strategy. Now think about this. I'm one of the people who helped do the school reform in, in the 1980s and early 1990s in Oregon. I and my colleagues got recruited to come to Washington, D.C. J.D. Hoy, who headed the School to Work Office in the Clinton administration, when we were focused on making this damn same connection, right? We did the 2 plus 2. We tried to connect our grade schools and our community colleges, which are half voc I don't even use the word voc tech. I will use professional technical, right? We can't call it that stuff anymore. But trying to make these connections, trying to have a strategy, and we built it off of a bigger seminal report before the gathering storm, before this one, which was called, came out of the National Center for Education and the Economy, about the skills of the American workforce for the 21st century. I mean, we, I, my frustration level at having this conversation for 30 years is beyond belief. And here we are again, deja vu. We actually know some of the answers. It isn't about how innovative we are. It's actually about doing these things that we know, that we've talked about till, till death. Or we moved on to something else. We abolished the school for school to work office. We moved on to you know uh, giving children a second chance to leave no child behind and all this stuff. I mean, we lack focus, and I, I would argue we'd also lack focus that is inspirational, just like you were talking about, Tony. That makes kids want to do something different. They see it's real. They can touch it. They can smell it. It becomes part of their being. One of the things we tried to do in Oregon was do combined curriculums, which combined the professional technical along with the traditional education. So you actually were doing English while you were doing some of the professional technical work, a way of reorienting some of our curriculum to help provide and meet both those goals so kids have the skills to go either path, right, to be able to do those type of things. I'm sorry, I'm unloading here. I've got a, you know, <laughs> I got a lot of passion about this stuff. So I think this is, this is really important to really just put it in a context of we've got to have a strategy as a country, and we clearly see as a, as a union movement the connection between our national security and our economic security and it's tied to our educational and training systems as well. We are, it's a system and we're tied to this together. The industrial base the last panel talked about is no different from the manufacturing base. They're one and the same. And what you see is the combination of these technologies they are not just used for the defense base, but in fact are used across the commercial base. They're the same thing. We have this conversation that's somehow different. It's not. I go out and lecture at the National Defense University every year to talk about the manufacturing base and the connectivity. I would make the same point, that evolution, where we've seen the connections, the technologies, are the same thing we see in the workplace. Now, I'm not talking just about IT here. I'm not, that's not my forte. But I clearly know that for the frontline skilled workforce in advanced manufacturing, electromechanical are combined with computer interface technology. And the workers in the workplace today are expected to deal with this and to be able to do maintenance around it and to be able to have it work in the right way. So the sets of skills we're seeing in the advanced workplace are different than before and we've done a lot of work at that. I, I would say we can learn from others about having strategy and doing things and everybody likes to talk about Germany and so do I. I'm one of the people who set up the original tours to go look at all this stuff about apprenticeship systems. People don't know it. The AFL-CIO, our unions in the apprenticeable crafts, run the largest training system in the United States. Far and away. Far bigger than anybody else. 
talking billions of dollars, talking millions of workers, huge interface with the community colleges and, and on the local level and doing part of this work. They're part of our, they're our partners in these things about this and the idea of certification of the knowledge and skills and crafts that come with that. We have also done this in manufacturing. I'm one of the founders of the Manufacturing Skills Standards Council. Again, another thing we abandoned that we tried with the National Skills Standards Board with the original Clinton administration. And the Manufacturing Skills Standards Council is the one that survived and emerged and exists today. And if you look at the National Association of Manufacturing and their skills initiative, we're the centerpiece. We are a joint labor management thing. We work with thousands and thousands of workers thousands of businesses to derive these standards and to provide something in place that certifies workers' production skills, their distribution and logistical skills, this, and a whole series of other things. You can look that up at www.mssc.org and see much more about that. But it's out there and working with Ivy Tech as a partner. We're working with Indiana, working with states around the country and making this available and working with community colleges and other training providers, but particularly the community college system, as part of the training and assessment and certification model there. The one thing the manufacturing workers don't have in this country is portable, certifiable skills, which are your credit card to getting into that next place, that next job, that next store, and trying to have a system that is portable across state lines. Frankly, the one problem that I have with the education and training system of community colleges, there's a real tendency to say, no, 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 we have to redo and invent it here all on our own. Mm -hmm. And I like what Tony commented about, you got a model, use it, figure out how you can plug into these things. And we developed this with all the advanced industries in this country. And that, that, that's what should be happening to help uh, the uh, frontline production workers have the skills they need across these technologies and lines. I mean, and the vision and viewpoint of what that workplace is today is very different from the steel mills and auto plants that I worked in 35 years ago. That's not that world. And there's real opportunity there. And we have the same issue, this issue that is cross-cutting here. I mean, look at me. I'm a boomer. I'm on my way out. I'm part of that silver tsunami that is coming. I was part of the big study we did last year looking at the energy industry and utilities with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, we see the same numbers in, in manufacturing where the average age of the workforce in the aerospace industry is 55 years old. This stuff is coming. And in education, like these other industries, some of these retirements have been delayed because of the economic circumstances we're in. But they're coming. Mm -hmm. So even in a time when these industries have downsized, there's going to be massive turnover and opportunity there. The last point I would make on this, it was interesting, it was with Dr. Hill from Cleveland State uh, two weeks ago. And, and he's done a ton of work uh, in this area of workforce training and education. And because I heard many of these today, my God, we've got all these jobs out here and we just can't find workers to fill them. Well, they did an extensive study of Pennsylvania of this very subject. And I listened to a long, humorous description from the doctor say, this is what businesses told us. We looked at the job description. We looked at this. And he said, I finally came to the conclusion they're looking for purple squirrels when they say they can't fill these jobs because they are looking for such specific sets of skills to fit a specific niche within their business, they say they can't find somebody to do it. Well, they're not going to find somebody to do it. It doesn't mean that people don't have skills and that they can't learn and that they can't be trained to do this. But the assumption is that everybody's supposed to walk in with that very specific set of skills. And that's not realistic either. You know, that's really a question of how we have people that have the fundamental skills and what the first line of what they want is will people show up on time, will they work hard, that kind of stuff. Foundational skills, can they read, can they write, can they have some math. And then there's all the other specific skills that come. It's one of the reasons we have the certification process. The other thing we've done as a labor movement, we have a national labor college, which people can go and get certificate degrees and two-year degrees and four-year degrees, and we provide specific things, everything from production management to you know, operating and, and managing uh, uh, construction projects and a number of other things, along with certifications and offer both. But we actually do assessment in this process and life skills and people can actually acquire college credit as part of this. Recognition for their knowledge and skills they have going in. And this is all part of why having a good, rigorous, focused skill standard system so that people can get certified at their community colleges and get recognition for this is really, really important. And these are the types of things that we continue to work at uh, in terms of providing 
the frontline skilled workers in manufacturing an opportunity to have these portable credentials, why we have a labor college that's focused on these things, and why we work at the community level. The other example, money, some of you may have heard of in here, from Wisconsin actually, is the Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership, which pulled together four of the major employers and their entire supply chains in Milwaukee. And this goes back again a dozen years. These are my friends. I worked with them. The labor movement working with the employers came together and then approached the education system and said, here's what we need from you. Here's how we connect our, our high school students with professional technical opportunities and get some experience. Here's how we train and retrain workers. Here's how we can get access to technology in different workplaces, one of the critical problems in technical education at the community college level. How do you even access some of the workplace technologies? Because you can't buy this stuff. You can try and borrow. We did this in Oregon. I've done this. It's very hard to get these things and run centers so people can get experience on this stuff. You really got to work with employers around opening avenues of access so people can see, touch, and smell what this stuff is and that there's opportunities. So these are the ways we believe to go. I don't think it's a, it's a question of being tricky and being innovative and finding new things. I think it's actually working with the things we know, the things we should do, and actually trying to think together as a country about how we're going to do these things in the future. Training as a strategy alone cannot lead the nation. If you look at the other countries around the world, they're thinking about what their employment strategy is and then training to that opportunity. And that's where we've got to uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Thanks. Um, before I open it up to this shy panel for some questions from, I know, a not shy audience, um, Daphne wanted to make a comment. Well, just one thing I wanted to say was that J.D. Hoy, who you uh, spoke of so well, is the executive director of NAF. And yeah. So uh, say hi clearly, I <laughs> so clearly, uh, um, there are people out there trying to take those ideas and bring them into the 21st century. The only other comment I wanted to make is that um, last week I had the opportunity to spend time at Autodesk in San Francisco. And Autodesk, of course, is very interesting because they're an enterprise software, CAD CAM, the back end of a lot of what we see. And the CEO of Autodesk made two comments that I think are relevant here. The first was that he has certainly a worldwide uh, workforce, but that he has 1,500 engineers in China and that in the next two years, the cost of doing business in China will not be less than the cost of doing business here, both just in terms of labor costs and then just all those intangibles, but that he cannot and would love to put a plant in the heartland of America, in Iowa, with 1,500 engineers. And the question is, where is he going to find those 1,500 engineers mm -hmm. who are skilled at the level that a company like Autodesk needs in order to provide that. On the other hand, he said that where he sees job innovation happening is using technologies like Autodesk, that there are, and we haven't talked about this, but that entrepreneurship is a huge mm -hmm. part of all of this, and, that, and that's true for women in particular, and is also true in terms of more agile manufacturing. And what he's seeing is a lot of people using Autodesk's technology mm -hmm. to build customized products and unique products. And those workforces are made up of skilled engineers and then a whole lot of p other people who are agile and flexible mm -hmm. because these are lean operations and that's just the nature of startups. They need to be lean. So there needs to be people who have some of that technical savvy but are also open and diverse enough that they're going to change as the jobs grow. And, you know, we, we, we are so proud of that in our country in terms of startups and technologies that we talk about from Microsoft to Cisco to mm -hmm. Steve Jobs who's on our minds this week. And the idea of how you grow with the industry that you're in and as that industry goes, grows and to maintain agility that allows you to develop the skills you need. And I, I think that's just a sort of piece of the formula that we really need to, it's not just about training technicians. It's about. <laughs> can, can I ask my colleagues a question and for everybody else in the room? Because one thing struck me this morning, I wrote a note to myself about it. You know, there's a number of comments made that, well, geez, everybody's going to change jobs 10 to 15 times over the course of their lifetime. So if I'm an employer, why would I invest in training and education? I mean, is this a barrier? I mean, how do, you know, what does this prove to be? I mean, I, I deal with actually some of this in manufacturing, of people who won't train because they'll lose their people to somebody else. But, how, you know, this theory that everybody's going to switch jobs, be job switchers their entire lives, that, you know, I'm just curious as to what you think of How many of, of those are within the same company? 
or or within the same field. So I don't know. It's Dr. Cavalli didn't mention this, but I've heard him say it a few times about if you have a degree in engineering, pretty much you're gainfully employed in this country. You might not be an engineer, which is a completely separate problem, but you're gainfully employed. And every friend of mine who has an engineering degree, I ask them. I have one friend, he runs a burrito company in western North Carolina. He's an electrical engineer. Worked for the Navy for 10 years. I have another friend who draws computer program. He draws um, cartoons for DreamWorks, but he's an engineer, and that's why they hired him. Because it's, you are, you're able to learn. And at Oracle, and I've t- I always talk to our employees because we encourage you to get education and training and we run our own university it's free you can go home at night and do it whatever you know i've asked and they're like oh no no no. if you don't do it your boss will get mad at you because we're only as good as our our, the last thing we know we're only as good as our last hire so the better we are the smarter we are the faster we are it just helps the whole pie and like i said 90 percent of the people we hire come from other companies so and then they come back and then they you know it's all and it's never for money it's for the challenge um, which I was surprised by. So that's, you know, it's good. They're, they want to do something, you know, in an access system instead of an <laughs> Oracle system, and then they come back and forth, and it's, it's good for the whole, r- rising the whole tide. Yep. Um, questions? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann Drobnes, and I'm actually a teacher. I'm a math and computer science teacher in Fairfax County, and it's... <laughs> I, I'm in a unique position. I'm at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Tech, so every student is required to take computer science. I think it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I see you guys, I hear you talking, and in nature, the name of this panel, Creative Solutions for 21st Skilled te- Workforce. Yet we're in a system that doesn't enable us to be creative. We've got standards, we've got mm-hmm. tests. I'm at a unique school that we don't have to worry about those tests as much. We can create our own curriculum to some extent. I bet more schools would love to do your Oracle Academy, but they can't fit it into their curriculum. We can't even get computer science into the curriculum because it doesn't necessarily fit. So how can we, and Tony talked about it, you know, fit it into a system, but we can't all fit it into charter schools or whatnot because our students are all in public schools. So how do we get these creative out of the box solutions or even not necessarily creative out of the box solutions we're all talking that stem education is more important it needs to be happening earlier on dc public schools they barely even teach science in elementary school Mm -hmm. how do we work that with the current framework of the standards-based testing that our kids have to take in i love math but in only math and english sarah um and i actually I, I, I always use TJ as an example of, we already know how TJ works. I know about at least five or six people in the cl- first graduating class of TJ. And the person who emailed me yesterday for the Oracle database job is a TJ graduate. Um, my girlfriend, who has a liberal arts degree and then she has a master's in museum studies, she's a tech worker now. Again, solely based on her education she got at Thomas Jefferson in the 90s. You know, TJ, we can replicate TJ. We've never replicated TJ. I don't understand. Um, why TJ can't be replicated, but it, it has to be bottom down, top up, top down, bottom up. You know, I, I volunteer in DC public schools and the two kids I, I tutor, I'm like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Computer scientist. Because every time we do a math problem, I show him how that creates his entire life and back. And same thing for, for the, you know, we play around with the girl. She wants to be a physics major, an engineering major. We play with that. But if there are or requirements, and right now in this climate, you have to make strong recommendations to allow computer science not to be an elective, you know, and to engage that, and then to do teacher training. But Thomas Jefferson, if we could replicate that, in, even in every school district in the country, it would completely change how higher education works. But I think we also have to roll up our sleeves and talk about Cameron, you know, <laughs> and what we're trying to do with computing in the core and, yeah. and, and, and ACM. and. <laughs> Part of this is, I would argue, a multi-pronged strategy. I mean, we, we built a school of the future in Philly. West Philly didn't cream anybody, worked closely with the school district. Every kid who's graduating is going to go to college. Okay. Can be done, but we didn't do it in concert with Oracle, and maybe we should have, or Cisco or anybody else. So if we're going to move legislators, whether at the federal level, state level, or local level, it's not going to be Microsoft doing it or Oracle mm-hmm. or any one entity doing it. It, it is going to be a partnership of folks who come to the table and say, wait a minute, this isn't good enough anymore. These kids are ready to solve the world's problems, and you're not letting them. Mm-hmm. So we're going to figure out a way to let them do that. 
I mean, we've got 4,200 jobs open at Microsoft right now, 2,600 of which are for computer science kids. Same problem that Sarah articulated earlier. And, and, and it's not just our company. It's Alcoa. It, it's GE. It's mm -hmm. everybody across the board. Tony, I'm sorry. I would just say partnerships are the answer, and, the, and the, the, the answer really is about increasing the visibility of those partnerships. TJ has a wonderful foundation that sole job is, is to make sure that they've got the equipment they need so that the kids can do the work that they do at TJ. But do, we, do the kids, the students know what the businesses that those companies that are su supplying that information, and it goes across the board, and it's really just about increasing interaction between business and education, I think. There's a new group that's uh, put, uh, there's a group called Career Cruising that's put together a CC Inspire activity, which is uh, an online career exploration activity which engages businesses, local businesses, in schools uh, virtually uh, throughout the whole process of career exploration. Those are the kinds of examples of things that we need to start moving towards simply because well, what we, what we know is that if, there, if we had a model uh, counseling system in United States schools, then the counselors could be the intermediaries between uh, education and careers. But the way that we do counseling in the United States, it doesn't really lend itself to that. So somebody's got to step into that void, and it's either got to be businesses or actually, you know, talk about entrepreneurship. If somebody could start a business that does counseling for high school kids, I bet you'd make a lot of money because the kids are not getting the information that they need to plan out their lives. We have time for probably one or two more questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Denise Lewis, uh, DC First. I want to applaud the first <laughs> fans and supporters in the room. You couldn't have done a better job. Um, I'm here to actually speak to um, anyone who has a creative solution or innovation to something that was spoken to before. Uh, FIRST programs don't work without mentors. Uh, we have 14 schools in the District of Columbia and it's nothing short of heroic for them to show up at an event with a robot that's partially completed. We cannot get mentors into these schools in the city to work with our teams. Although we have plenty of support financially, you support our regionals, you support the team's registration fees. I would like to know what you're doing in terms of engaging your employees to come into our schools. Are you offering comp time or some type of incentive to get the expertise? As someone, Kelly mentioned earlier, 16% um, of the students are interested and prepared. We're engaging the students that are, don't, may not know they're interested and they're certainly not prepared. But you have to show up. You have to get your hands on the robot and work and talk with the students. So I'd like some feedback on what ways you're engaging your employees to consider or to be able to come. The volunteer appeal is not working here. This is our fourth year and we need help. I can start. You can, you can start. <laughs> I mean, I think I was in um, the nonprofit world and um, non-governmental and governmental for about 30 years before I came to this company. One of the reasons I came to this company, quite frankly, is because of our citizenship proposal uh, efforts and what we do. Simply on volunteerism, one thing we do is if you go work at a at, or volunteer at a particular entity, a nonprofit, for every hour that you work, we will pay that entity $17 an hour. Um, to help provide the financial contribution. We will also, practically any entity in the country that you that an employee of ours gives a dollar to, we will match it dollar for dollar across the board. Um, we do about 1,000 mentoring engineerships at um, Microsoft every year. Um, it's one of the largest mentoring programs, I think, in the country. Um, we can always do more. I'll be at Bertie Backus in a couple of weeks, in fact, looking at how we can support um, what's going on there. But it, I think it still gets back to the larger question. Mm -hmm. There are folks committed in this room to do the right thing. How do we get to the folks who maybe need a little bit of nudge to, to play in the same sandbox with all of you? Because no matter how many resources Microsoft, Oracle, Cisco, whoever puts on the board, it's never going to be enough if we don't coordinate it better, if we don't leverage it better and bring all those assets to bear together to try to solve some of these problems. Um, and I think that's going to be a real challenge for all of us. What is that glue? 
where is that leadership? Where does it come from? I'm still searching, and I know our company is still searching. We want to be part of that effort, but we know we can't do it alone. Um, and for us, we do have an Oracle volunteer program in about – I. Hopefully it hasn't changed in a few years, last few years, but about 90% of our employees aren't chained to their desk. They, they can come and go as they please and go volunteer in a public school, go volunteer with their kids, you know, do, do what they need to do to help, help serve their community, and we're very committed to the communities we're in. Um, in some places in Oracle, it's 100% the volunteer. Um, the interesting thing is it has to be, I, I volunteer with a program called Higher Achievement. 95% of our kids go to college. And they're middle school kids. I mean, they go through high school first, but they go to college. Mm -hmm. I'm heavily trained on how to be a volunteer, how to engage with these kids who m might have a completely different family life than I did in, in middle school. And sometimes I, I'm always hesitant. I'm like, I don't want to throw a bunch of engineers in a room with a bunch of seventh graders because they're going to skip, you know, because they don't realize the connection of seventh grade algebra to, you know, ninth grade algebra to what they're doing today because they were just naturally in tune to it. Um, but having good good volunteer programs that explain this is what you have to do to how this is how you engage students and i'd also reach out to the parents because all of our you know it's one of those things if your dad's an engineer you're probably going to be an engineer right you know that that's that's the nature of the system but are they reaching out to their kids to make sure that their kids are getting the best education are they demanding a computer science class in their local high school are they you know trying to replicate tj i mean the president of china knows about tj but I don't know if the president of the PTA in Kansas knows about TJ. And if they know, because it's, it's been in Brown for 20 years, we know how to do it. So if, if those things, if you start having parents screaming at PTA meetings, demanding, you know, 20, 2011 education, not 1958 education, I, I hope that will help push it a little bit forward too. I can lay an entire federal agency at your feet. So let's, <laughs> we'll just talk. The Department of Transportation actually came to me recently and asked me how they could get involved in FIRST Robotics. So I'll put you in touch with those people. <laughs> and lastly, um, I want to do one plug, and it's a shameless plug. Um, we've got a lot of veterans returning home in the next three years. Um, many of them are younger, less attachments to the workforce, um, probably lower educational levels at many, in, in many places. Um, we, we are trying to work with the president. I know a number of other companies are trying to. Many of these young men and women have incredible skills that we need, they need help transferring. And many of them have very solid technical skills that don't always get accredited in the armed forces. And so um, look to work with anyone and everyone to try to figure out how we can partner to provide more technical competence allow them to transfer those skills and allow them to, as seamlessly as possible, transition from their military careers into productive civilian lives in the future. We, we actually run a major program doing that. Hel you know, it's called Helmets to Heart. I know it well, Bob. No, our, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I think of that and I think of our apprenticeship training programs as um, they aren't exactly robotics, but there they are certainly related elements depending upon the craft. I thank you all so much for your attention and for all the work you do. Thank you. you. I wanted to thank this panel and the other panels as well. I, it's okay. become common in Washington to, to, put, to use the phrase that President Kennedy used, that never since Thomas Jefferson dined alone have we had so much talent assembled in a single room. And I, I think it really applies to not only the talent of this panel and the preceding okay. panels, yeah. but really the, the spirit, the um, willingness, the roll up the other sleeve approach. I think it really is just exactly what we need, not only here in Washington, D.C., but very much in the entire country. And uh, Denise, great plug. Hopefully we can get those volunteers for the first robotics teams. I want to particularly thank Lucy Sanders. This is the second pleasure we've had. In co-sponsoring an event with her and it's just she is one of these people that is going to change the country very much like Dean Kamen and her partner in I can't say crime her partner in virtue uh, <laughs> is Paula Stern who the two have put the two of them together and you know good things are going to happen so please join me in a round of applause again thanking the panel and the two of them.